Honey LeBronc stars in her own YouTube cooking series, The Vegan Drag Queen, and she hosts a podcast called Big Fat Vegan Radio. Um, she used to travel the world with her one woman drag show pre-COVID and in her first year of fundraising in 2019, performed 55 shows in four countries in 46 cities for 2,300 people, raising over $27,000 for local LGBTQ and animal organizations along the way. Wow. Honey is committed to bringing discussions about animal rights, race, and pro-intersectional social justice to new audiences. And it has even been arrested in 2011, it was one of eight uh, activists arrested for blocking New York City traffic while demonstrating for marriage equality. When not a drag queen, Honey's Facebook page says that she's in a complicated relationship with Ben Strothman who is an actor, singer, playwright, and theatrical producer, originally from Milwaukee. Theatrical oh, photographer. Photographer, what did I say? Producer. Producer. That's yeah. next. Oh, that's, there you go. You're so multifaceted, I just thought I'd add something. Um, theatrical photographer. And, and so definitely, yeah, lots of complex things going on with Honey, and um, yeah. just, finished doing an interview with doctors. Now you're in New York City, honey. What is yeah. the current COVID situation there? Well, uh, well, first I have to ask, where did you get uh, that, that uh, bio from? Oh, that was a combination of different things. I think some from your Facebook, I looked at yeah. all your social media and um, mostly from your website, is it? Uh, well, I, I, I should say, I have since done a hundred eleven up until COVID, a hundred eleven shows oh. uh, in seventy three cities in five countries, benefiting one hundred forty eight different organizations. And to date, I have raised forty four thousand forty one dollars for animal rights organizations and uh, LGBTQ organizations. That is amazing. Yeah, yeah. Just and. Right it, it had been going so well, and then now th this happened, but it's kind of giving me an opportunity to get creative and ask myself, like, is there another way I could go about it? And so um, I am in my, I'm so sorry, I wasn't expecting company today, or, or I would have cleaned. Um, but no, I am in my uh, apartment right now, and obviously there's a professional green screen behind me. I, before COVID happened, or before we had shelter in place orders uh, uh, in early March. I uh, had this strong internal directive that I don't want to go back on the road. Um, you know, that's how I earn m most of my living now is, is doing fundraiser shows. And I had this gut feeling that I need to take a break from touring and find a way to justify staying home for like two or three even months and just turn my apartment into a multimedia creative studio. You know, I am a photographer, so I wanted to turn this into a photo video studio with a complete green screen. And uh, so I got it, my wish, in like a monkey's paw kind of way. Um, and uh, so this is, for me, sort of a golden opportunity to really justify turning my home into my studio. And now I can start doing fundraiser shows for organizations everywhere, whether or not I'm able to actually make it there in person. So I am looking to start resuming those soon um, with whichever organizations want to contact me to do a fundraiser. If someone does want to contact me, you can find all my info at vegandragqueen.com. But if you go to vegandragqueen.com and click on tour, there are several surveys there that you can fill out. So if you're like, I want you to come to Alberta. You can fill out your information there. And that way I have a little Google map where I will see, oh, there's people in Alberta that want me and I'll know who to get in touch with. Um, or if you have an organization that you would like me to fundraise for, that's where you can submit your information so I know that you're interested. And while you're there, uh, click on mailing list and sign up for my mailing list so that when I have shows virtually or in your city, you will hear about them. Um, so the COVID thing in New York, um, it's, it's scary to think about the numbers here. Um, I mean, my God, I remember hearing 
like, oh, a man in Westchester, which is just a bit above New York City, um, has the first case of COVID in New York State. And I remembered thinking like, it's just a matter of time. I mean, there are so many people in New York City and the traffic patterns alone. I mean, we are, you know, if, if um, you're in Vancouver, you're in... Victoria. Vancouver. Victoria. I was so close. Same thing. Close, if, well, same, if close. Victoria is... I've never been to that part of Canada. I've only been to... Um, it was a uh, like tour... Torrent, Toronto, Toronto, is it Toronto? I've heard of that. Toronto, I think it's called. Mm -hmm. I've been to Toronto and then um, drove from there to Detroit. So um, I've only really seen that part. I I, I want to tour Canada. I really, really do. Um, if, If Victoria is a gentle pond, New York City is like a rushing river. I mean, think about which one the food coloring is going to spread through faster, right? Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's scary to think. That was a weird analogy, but someone out there got it. It's weird to think um, how prevalent the problem is here. And everyone knows someone who has been affected by COVID. For me, this is, Alexa, how many days has it been since March 13th? March 13th, 2020 was 73 days ago. This is 73 days of sheltering in place in my apartment. So um, it's funny, while it's a a big problem here, I'm not seeing it because I'm sitting around at home. And then instead of going to the gym, because they're all closed, I go running along the Hudson River, but I only go at night when there are no other human beings out. And maybe once every 10 or 12 days, I'll, I'll go to the grocery store. But even then... I'll go like 20, 30 minutes before they close. So there's no one there. So um, it's, 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 it, it, oh, and, and if I have errands to run, I'll try to do them all on one day in one small geographic area. So I'm managing to stay pretty well contained and I'm, I'm lucky enough that I live alone. So I, I feel like I'm not the right person to ask because I'm not like, yes, I'm in New York City, but I'm like very, very sheltered from it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, uh, you know, and uh, you mentioned that everybody in New York is going to know someone who has. I know someone in New York who has it, and it happens to be a high school friend of mine that I hadn't talked to forever, and happened to reach out when it happened. I thought, who do I know in New York City? And 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 I I reached out, and sure enough, he was sick, home, home yeah, sick with it. So. It's a, it's a big scary thing and it's changing everything and including, hopefully encouraging a lot of people to review their personal habits in terms of um, lifestyle and especially food. And, um, and that's where we connected was at an animal liberation conference. You were a marvelous host. And so I'm wondering, is that like when you talk about all your fundraising, it'd be wonderful to have you in Vancouver or Victoria or on the island here somewhere. Um, so when you talk about doing a show or a fundraiser, what, what is your show? Is it like a comedy stand-up or? It's generally, um, I mean, it's interesting. Drag is very regional. So how drag is done in New York is very different from how they do drag in Oklahoma City, very different from Milwaukee. So in New York, a drag show is usually just one drag queen on stage for 60 to 90 minutes, holding down the fort the whole time, keeping the audience engaged. Whereas uh, in some other cities, a drag show will be like one drag queen. I'm, I'm going to say it in the way that I'm making fun of them because I don't find it entertaining. But it's like one drag queen will be the host which means she's in the dressing room on a microphone, like, Milwaukee, give it up. How are you feeling tonight? And it's like, I I don't know who you think I'm connecting with. Your voice on a mic, what what your voice on a microphone is telling me is that you have more more important places to be right now than with your audience. And then it will just be like a parade of other performers coming out, doing one number, not interacting or talking with the audience, just performing their number. Then they go backstage and they change, change, change. I, I, I did uh, the, one of the, probably the first ever solo show I did as a fundraiser. It was in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. 
And um, there was like 10 or 12 drag queens in the dressing room getting ready to do a show after mine. And I was out on stage. I thought it was 60 minutes. Turns out it was 90. I come backstage and they were like, were, were you hosting? Or, and I was like, I don't know what you're asking me. And they're like, well, were you in the show or were you hosting it? And I'm like, I just did a show. I don't know what you're at. And they're like, wait, wait, who else was on stage with you? I'm like, just me, why? And they're like, well, how did you do your changes? And I'm like, what changes? They're like, well, your costume changes. And I'm like, what's wrong with what I'm wearing? <laughs> you know, so the idea is like, if you aren't constant, I'm like, listen, if I'm on stage and all you can focus on is like, huh, she's still wearing the same outfit. She started the show. I guess I must not be doing a good job of entertaining you. So um, at any rate, um, yes, the show, I, I, that's my little rant on, um, on what I think makes a good drag show. Uh, my show is basically a 90 minute show, me on stage, just doing whatever I feel like doing in the moment. Some lip syncing, some live singing, um, and just bantering with the audience and uh, step touching and reinforcing stereotypes and just generally bringing shame to my hometown. At Honey LeBronx. And so are you out as a vegan when you're on stage? Oh, absolutely. I yeah. mean, I generally pick a animal rights organization and a LGBTQ organization. You know, part of the idea for that is if I come to a small town and I pick two animal rights organizations to fundraise for, both of them are inviting the same people, like they're pulling from the same community. So we're only going to get a certain number of people. If I open this to a second cause, a second community, we potentially double the numbers. You know, if we only bring 20 people in and we're raising it for two animal rights orgs, we're still raising the same amount of money for the animals. If I bring in an LGBTQ organization and we bring in 40 total, we still raised the same amount for the animal rights org, plus we raised something for the LGBTQ organization. And I make more money that way because we had more people and the bar will have a better time and make more money. And that's how we're going to get invited back. Um, what was your question? And if did that answer? If you're out as a vegan on stage. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. I mean, listen, I, I put it this way. Vegans will have a very good time at my show, which people might find that hard to believe that vegans can ever have a good oh, time. We're so Because I know that we have to be like really super serious about everything all the time. And if you laugh at something, then that means you're being insensitive to all the awful in the world. Listen, if you're able to be that 100% angry and serious and engaged 24 seven your entire life, good for you. I am a complex whole individual. And I know that there are times where I'm like, I just need to laugh. Like after 10 at night, I, don't let myself look at politics. I just don't. Like after 10 at night, I usually want to watch the Young Turks or I want to watch something on YouTube and like, oh God, what did Trump do now? And I have to remind myself like, nope, it's 10 at night. If I watch that now, I'm going to get so angry and I'm going to get madder and madder. And then I'll be like all wound up at 3 a.m. writing angry emails. I'm like, no, after 10, I only let myself laugh. That's it. So, um, yeah, whatever we can laugh about, we can create distance from, you know, and whatever we can laugh about, we can talk about. So um, I, uh, I do take pride in my ability to make even the most gluten-free, lesbian-y, backyard, chickens-y, vegans. Well, you're not vegan if you have backyard chickens, but you know what I'm saying. Um, I will even make them laugh. Um, and that's not easy to do. So, um, but... If, if people are like, oh, I'm not vegan, I'm like, you especially come to my show because if you're not vegan, you're going to have a great time at my show. It's just, a dra it's impossible to not have a fun time at a drag show, whether you're vegan or not. Absolutely. And you're building community as well by bringing these different groups of, of people together. It's always beautiful to see after a show, we'll be in the dressing room counting our money. I'm, you know, taking off the chapstick and watching, I'm thinking specifically uh, in Columbus, Ohio, it was the group Glisten, and I think Sunny Acres Sanctuary, I forget the exact name, but uh, a sanctuary. 
And just hearing the LGBTQ organization saying like, yeah, you know what? I only eat blah, 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 but you know, I'm definitely rethinking my, like they just automatically found themselves rethinking their relationship to animals just because of what we had been through. Um, and inviting the other organization out, like we should get together, we should partner up again. Hey, I know a great place where we can go for, and they have all these vegan options. Uh, it's, it's such a wonderful way to plant a seed with people who are already in the social justice movement and to get them to consider including all living beings in social justice. Right, and, and yeah, the, the word vegan is really, I, I remember when I was, I was vegetarian for 10 years, and that was- No one's years. perfect. 30 years ago, thank you. Well, I thought at the time that I was, I thought this is it. Look at me, I'm so great, I'm a social justice activist and I'm working for the environment and I'm a vegetarian. And then one day finally, you know, I figured it out and realized that, oh my gosh, there's all this stuff going on that I should really have known about, but I managed to close myself off to. Yeah. And um, so, so, um, Oh, sorry, I've lost my train of thought. I remember sure. I, I loved what you said. I've listened to a few of your radio shows and I love where you say, I'm just going to keep talking now because I think my thought will come back to me. Yes. At some I'm point. finding that if I forget <laughs> what I'm saying, I'm like, oh, what was I trying to say? And I just let it go. And I'm like, I'm just going to continue talking about the next thing. It will always bring me right back. I'm sure if you do that right now, you'll remember what you're trying to say. So uh, yeah, so so vegetarian for um, ten years, and then and then uh, became vegan finally. I, all right, I got it. And uh, so you know, you mentioned about the backyard chickens, and it's interesting how I was speaking with um, Jonathan Jonathan Balcom yes yesterday or on the weekend about um, his new book Superfly. He's now he's the guy who wrote uh, What a Fish Knows. You're all about uh, the fishes and yeah. um, the and the, the inner lives of fishes and uh, there's complex social relationships and stuff such things and now he's writing a book about insects and bugs and flies and all the things we don't know about them and and you know I, I kept going referring to the vegan brain like the the rewiring that happens you know at first I thought backyard chickens they're so cool and I can eat the eggs because there they are and even though I'm vegan and yeah eventually I the I, they lost all appeal to me. So I have to ask you then, Honey LeBronx, and I know you've had this question a million times, but mm -hmm. so you were, you were a drag queen first and then you came vegan. Is that why you have honey or? Well, I'm not point? entirely vegan yet. I am working on it. Um, I definitely gave up like red meat. Um, and I just think like, as long as I know where my food is coming from and it's local, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Oh I'm my kidding. gosh. I'm kidding. Okay. I'm kidding. I love putting vegans through that. I use in my show sometimes when people are like, as long as I know where my food comes from, and I love going through the audience. It's like, man, where are you from? You're from Detroit? It's okay. I knew where she came from. She came from Detroit. I mean, God, people will just justify anything. Um, no, I actually started doing drag um when I was 30. And I became vegan one month later. Um, and as for my drag name, I see no problem with my name being Honey. How many bees do I need to kill to call myself Honey? Ab exactly zero. When people even make an issue out of my name being Honey, I'm like, you must have just signed every single change.org petition and led every single parade and built every home for the homeless because apparently you've taken every action and step that you have the free time to worry about bs that doesn't matter um no honey is a name it's a name it's a, I, I know women named honey and i picked my drag name 11 years before i ever did drag and i'm sure that there's people out there i was like well it's a drag name you can change it you don't get to tell me that I that I, whether my name is significant or not, like you don't get to tell me like oh it should be easy to change your name. Like I honestly, when 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 people take, I know that you're just asking, but when people like take issue with that, I'm like you are the wrong kind of vegan. Just like I just come, it it bothers me so much. 
uh, thank you, and and I appreciate that. It's just I, you know, the B thing is is a contentious issue, and, oh, and I, heard, sure. I heard someone say the other day that um, that they had heard some vegans eat honey, and I thought, well, no, no, no. And also, fun fact: my name gives me so many opportunities to bring up the issue that honey is not vegan. I love telling people, I'm like, I am the only vegan honey you're ever gonna find. I mean, unless there's another drag queen named Honey. Um, and people what are like, well, what do you mean? What do you mean honey's not vegan? And I'm like, think about it. Is it yours? Who, who are the bees making honey for? And like, that's, that's a, I don't even wanna say anything else about why honey is not vegan, because I shouldn't have to. Well, honey yeah. is not mine any more than your diary belongs to me. It's like, no, that's yours. I don't get to touch it. Yeah, there's a perception that if the animal doesn't die, then it's okay, you know, the wool and the, it's, an, it's a whole educational thing. So in yeah. your show, then somehow you're able to bring these non-vegans and vegans together and somehow, make fun of it and but not insult people or do you care about that i mean i think you know i'll put it this way i used to work when i lived in milwaukee i used to work at a uh 50s 60s style theme restaurant called ed de Bevix, where the servers are very rude to you like we don't play historical characters but we all kind of make our own character that we play and like, we're very catty and very rude. Like, what do you want? Sit anywhere, I don't care. You know, that kind of place. And there was one young woman, I say young woman because she was over the age of like 16 or 17. I'm making a concerted effort to stop saying girl when I'm talking about like a woman. I mean, I'll say young woman, because whenever I say woman, I feel like we picture like 40 and up. Um, but you would never go to the bank, like you want to open an account? Yeah, talk to the boy behind the counter. You would be like, why? Oh, that's weird. Um, so anyway, this young lady who I worked with, she was just always in a sour mood and she would just come to work and just like, what? I don't know. I ask someone like, she would just actually be in a bad mood. And I wanted to tell her like, love, that does not translate. They are not like, oh, ha, 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 ha. I'm having a great time. Look, she's so funny. I'm like, you can tell when someone is trying to make sure you're having a good time or not. So I have a way about me to begin with, um, but even more so in drag, a way about me that I can say anything I want to anybody and they will allow me to say it because I, I've found a way to say it that is entertaining, it's funny, you know? Even if I've said something that's offensive, I'm saying it in a way that you're like, that is funny, and I'm going to thank you for making me laugh. Um, and, you know, one thing I like to tell my audience at the beginning of the show is, you know, I'll find my vegans. I'm like, okay, so first of all, where are my vegans at? Make some noise if you're vegan, okay? And then I'll say, and now um, make some noise if just nothing matters. <laughs> nothing? Okay. Um, and I'll tell people, I'm like, listen, listen, listen. It's fine. Like, like, some people aren't vegan, you know? No one's perfect. I used to do things I'm not proud of. I once waited tables at a Dave and Buster's in Times Square, you know, so we all have like our dark past. But I will say to them, I'm like, listen, as vegans, we're very used to being made fun of. Like, we can handle being made fun of. It happens 365 days out of the year. So I'm like, non vegans, can I ask you something? Would it be okay? I mean, and tell me if it's not. Would it be okay with you if just for one night, we make meat eaters the butt of the joke. And they're always like, yeah, woo. I'm like, cause if you can't handle that, then maybe eating meat doesn't make you that tough after all. <laughs> so but by me, I mean, I set it up that they know where we're going and they know that it all comes from a place of love. Right, and you're, you're very loving. I, I've really enjoyed listening to your Big Fat Vegan Radio um, podcast. Thank and you. yeah, and you have a whole series on the COVID situation, which yeah. I, I think must have been really comforting. You know, I, I'm, I'm blessed to live in a country with um, some form of universal health care. It's not a perfect system, but we, we do have this understanding uh, growing up that we're here for each other. You know, that's we pay into the yeah. system and we get from the system and not all yeah. equally and not all perfectly, but it creates a, a feeling of compassion. And I, 
And we have a, this wonderful woman, I just want to send a shout out to, to Bonnie Henry, Dr. Bonnie Henry. I'm getting reclamped, waiting about. Mm. She's a provincial health minister, or health officer is her title. And she's just this voice of calm and reason who comes on, not so much anymore because we're, we're over, we're flat, we've flattened our curve, we're starting to reopen to because of her and her wise, you know, just honest this is where we're at and this is what we're hoping for but this is what we have to do and i think the the, the her motto is be calm be kind and be safe or something like that and i thought about her when you were speaking with the doctor i forget her name and but it was similar information it was just like this is where we are today yeah. and this is what you know what's going on in our community so i think your your radio just that's just the reason i've just become an, a new listener i'll have to Thank spend you. hours and hours listening to the other stuff and shout out to that was dr uh, priyam for the night she is a pulmonologist in uh, atlanta with a background in epidemiology. And she's just fast become one of my favorite people in the entire world. And was she one of the doctors that you were speaking with earlier today? No, she actually put me in touch with a doctor, uh, with a physician in, um, well, he's currently in upstate New York. And then it was two other nurses. It was basically three men, two nurses and a doctor. Uh, all who sort of specialize in dealing with gay men's sexual health because the, uh, and this wasn't really for my podcast so much. I'm going to use it for an episode. It was just more a, a Zoom call that was recorded because I want to create this as a resource and put it out there because I am seeing so many gay men online and on the apps still hooking up with guys like, and they're like, oh, no, no, it's okay because I already had COVID and I have antibodies now. And I'm like, that's not how that works. We still don't know if having antibodies gives you immunity. If it does give you immunity, we don't know if everyone develops immunity. If you do develop immunity, we don't know for how long. Is it permanent? Does it fade over time? If you do have immunity, this virus still mutates. In fact, it has just mutated to a far deadlier, more contagious form, which is now the dominant strain here in New York. So, oh, well, you got it and have antibodies. You don't have antibodies to this new version that's going around. And I just thought thumb typing this to hundreds of guys over days, it's just not the most effective way to get the word out. So um, I did this interview today just so I can kind of put this out there and the next step of my plan is I want to uh, do some interviews with other people who have big platforms, um, other drag queens, other people who are notable people in the gay community to share this information and also tell them where they can go and find this video. Mm. You know, my friend who, who in New York City, who, uh, as soon as I found out that he had the symptoms and he was staying at home and I was like, you got to go to the hospital. And he said, he said, no, 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 I'm in New York city in the hospital. So this was at the peak time. And he's like, I'm just going to ride this out at home. And he had some poor support. He had people bringing him his food and, and that sort of thing. And he was self-isolating and he, he healed. He, he was healthy and uh, he got over it. And um, then he went and got tested because he wanted to register himself as one of the survivors Mm -hmm. And he had no antibodies, but he had all the symptoms. Like so. That may well be. These tests, you have to understand, and I'm sure it's different in different countries. We rushed these tests to market. Um, these tests would normally go, uh, go through rigorous uh, testing and peer review and whatnot. These are raced tests. A lot of these tests produce false negatives and false positives. So um, the, the conclusion that I got from speaking with these um, medical professionals today is that the tests that we used already basically tell us nothing. So he, it sounds like he very well did have it, even though the test didn't confirm that. Hmm. It was probably the test, not him. Yeah, no, it sounded like he had it, but that, yeah, it sort of calls into question, what do we really know? I right? over-tightened my wig, and I'm trying to sit here and act okay. like I didn't. And I don't know if you've ever had a wig headache before, no. but imagine if you just put like a really, if you tied a really tight belt around your head, 
you know, for a few minutes it'll be tolerable. And then after two hours, it's like, oh, my head is in a vice. Give me one second. I'm just gonna quickly loosen Sure. This. I'm just gonna go um, shake my noise wood maker out the window for all our essential workers while you're doing that. Okay. Great. Do you guys do that too? The the noise making? Or oh, is that what you were doing? Oh, because yeah. you're three hours behind, right? right? You're like West Coast time. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and that's at seven or seven oh three. Seven. Well, seven o'clock. They go for oh, about okay. five minutes around here. Yeah. Oh, so. ours starts at seven, and it's done at seven oh two. Oh. Like it, <laughs> yeah. And I, yesterday it was so sad. Uh, yesterday, we um, I usually just kind of catch it off guard. I I I. I, I I love being a New Yorker, and I think it's so special that during this time, every day, this city makes sure that I'm awake. They all go to their windows, and they all make noise and scream and holler as their way of saying, honey, are you up yet? You should really get up. You should really wake up. I'm kidding. That's a joke. Um, but usually, I kind of miss it, and then it happens. I'm like, oh, right. Yesterday was one of those days where I'm like, I'm gonna go to the window at seven and actually be here for the start of it. And I went on Instagram Live and it's like, I think I heard maybe three people like, ooh, ooh. And I was like, ooh, New York is tired today. Like you could just, you could really hear the fatigue mm. that like today, like it's hard to keep our spirits up. But, um, but yeah, we do that here as well. Is, is, uh, is the curve um, flattening there, or is there a, a light um, at the end of the tunnel? Is there a tunnel? I asked the uh, medical professionals that on our um, call today, and then I think it's still a little hard to say definitively whether it's flattened, but um, I think flattening the curve is really a matter of underwhelming the hospitals, like under overwhelming, like de-overwhelming the hospitals. Um, and they said, yes, we are at the point now that our hospitals are no longer slammed and we're having to choose who gets treatment and who doesn't. So I would consider that having flattened the curve, which means nothing because that curve can very easily go back up, especially mm -hmm. when there's this many cases here. So Anything that is in favor of people relaxing their safeguards, I'm so wary of. And um, yeah, there's definitely people out there not wearing masks. There's people who wear their masks like this. And I'm like, what do you think that's doing for you? Um, uh, Dr. Uh, Priyam for the Nike, who we were talking about, she was on Facebook and she shared a picture. And it was like, one was a picture of the mask over the nose. And then the other one was a picture of like, the penis over the underwear. He's like, it's the same thing. It's meant to contain you, not for you to hang out over it. She's like, if this looks silly, this is just as silly. We have a small group of uh, COVID protesters uh, in in our town. And despite, despite them, um, uh, we're generally an obedient bunch, Canadians, you know, uh, we protest pipelines and such things and poverty oh, and all the other stuff. But when it comes to health, you know, we listen to Dr. Bonnie Henry and we stayed home and we wear our masks to the grocery store and we keep our two meter distance. And um, on Vancouver Island, we've had, I think it's day 16 with zero new cases. So for those people who think this is not worth it, you know, hang in there because you'll get there. That's the thing. I mean, a friend, a friend of mine was telling me, a friend of mine that was hanging out with me before we all had to find out where we're going to hunker down. We were talking about the quarantine and, you know, the quarantine comes from the Italian word for 14, you know, quarantine, uh, quarantine, 14. Um, so, it, so it generally refers to a 14 day period. Also, I'm aware that we're misusing the term quarantine. I'm not truly quarantining because I will go out for a run, which, you know, at night, or I'll go to the grocery store every like 10 days or so. Every time I leave my front door, it resets the quarantine, but I'm not under quarantine because I'm not, I don't believe that I'm sick. Uh, I get it. You can be asymptomatic. Um, and I'm not currently like planning on merging households. Like my parents were asking if I would come home for a visit maybe next month or early July. 
which I was thinking about it, but after talking to these to these um, medical professionals today, I do not think it's advisable. Just because I naturally assumed, oh, it'll be so nice to give my mom a hug again. And then I'm like, I'm flying in from New York? No. Like, I wouldn't go near my, and I don't think that would be possible for us to, to, to not, and I, I don't think they would get that me being home means like we have to stay in opposite room. I don't, uh, but my friend who was saying, you know, that when they were recommending a quarantine, when they were recommending a two week stay at home order, he said, well, politically, that's what they're suggesting. But he's like, scientists say, if it's going to be effective, it has to be eight weeks. And I remembered thinking like eight weeks. Okay, well, that's going to be hard, but we can do it. But that's before I realized we will not cooperate. We Americans, U.S. Americans, I learned from going to Canada, they're like, you know, we're America too. And I'm like, right. So now I always say U.S. Americans, which makes me feel like Miss uh, South Carolina in the, I think some U.S. Americans, but um, we just, we're so selfish. We're such a selfish country. And cooperation is just not in our nature. I, you know, like I'm from Wisconsin. I'm Midwestern. You know, growing up, we used to make fun of your accent in Canada until I moved to New York from Wisconsin and I talk and people are like, oh, are you from Canada? And I'm like, no. <laughs> so the joke's on me. But um, anywhere that they have our type of accent, generally there are like friendlier, more communal, more cooperative, work together um, people. And uh, the idea that my health, the idea that my chances of seeing my family again are contingent on society getting their act together and cooperating, it's, it's so infuriating. You know, what else is infuriating is, um, is that the virus came from the, the, the meat eaters, right? Yeah. That, you know, in a vegan world, we, we would not be doing this. Apparently there's billboards, I think in LA or New York going up saying that there was never been a virus outbreak at a tofu factory or something like that. So, I mean, I, I have this mm. lingering anger and, and, you know, already as vegans, we're upset at the pain and suffering that we know is happening every second of every day. And yet we, you know, we're supposed to present, we have to present as like these nice, friendly people because we can't express that anger <laughs> because, yeah. because we're vegan or nonviolent uh, as a, 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 a the most nonviolent thing we can yeah. do is, is be vegan. But I, I don't know that there's a vegan that doesn't have that awareness and understanding. And I don't know if you heard recently about Brian Adams. Uh, he lives in Vancouver. He's a famous Vancouver, you know, Brian Adams. Heard, right? heard I heard this. So he had this rant and, you know, oh. it's probably late at night and he's probably been drinking or whatever. And anyways, but the, the truth is that there is this anger towards this, the meat eating population. And um, just like I have anger towards politicians who, you know, now we're now in Canada, we're seeing that we're getting this universal basic income. I'm getting breaks on my hydro bill, mm. you know, which is a provincial crown corporation. Just about every, anything that is kind of socialized already. The buses have been free f for a couple of months. Like, yeah. and, it, and then it's like, well, why can't we do that at other times? So I'm not sure where I'm going with this, but. Well, I, I'd love to jump in right there because yeah, I, I have something to say about that. Uh, and for one with Brian Adams, just to be responsible for accuracy, he his comment was not about meat eaters. His comment was racist his comment was about china and about i i did an episode on my podcast i i'm, I'm currently in the middle of and i keep thinking it's going to be only five episodes and maybe well maybe six or well, maybe seven i i think by the time it's over it's going to be about 10 or 11 uh episodes long but i've been doing a series on covid um as it pertains to veganism and and, and sometimes not as it pertains to veganism 
but I did an episode specifically on COVID and anti-Asian racism. And uh, someone suggested just calling it racism because that's what it is. And I'm like, no, while it is racism, we need to address that this is racism specific to Asian people right now. Um, and I'm like, I, I, I want to just repeat a talking point from that episode, you know, uh, I interviewed two uh, Asian women who are vegans, Sarah Woodcock in Minnesota and uh, Dora Slim in New Jersey. I adore them both. And, um, you know, we were talking about things like Yulin, the dog meat festival, and, I, and they were talking about how that comes up. And I said, well, honestly, when people do mention that and bring that up, what do you say to that? And I, I remember thinking, well, I kind of struggle with that because at the end of the day, though, that is an awful thing. And and I kind of thought like, oh, I hope this isn't a difficult question to answer. It wasn't. She didn't miss a beat. She's like, listen, when we go outside Madison Square Garden and we protest the rodeo, does anyone ever say like, oh, why are white people so violent? Why are white people so hell bent on torturing? We never see race as an issue when it's something that white people are doing. We never see national origin as an issue when it's something that Americans are doing. But the, you know, I remember I was doing um, uh, a Facebook Live video, or was it Instagram Live? I think Facebook. I'm going to get this one here. Bam. Um, we were protesting there's a new Canada Goose um, flagship store that was opening in Soho. I'm, this hair is coming back for me, so I'm going to, I'm going to get her. And I'm going to lay her to the side. Uh, so we were, you know, and because of animal rights activists basically getting into the store and then starting uh, protests, they now had a line outside and they were only allowing like a certain number of people in the store at a time. So we're here like, and I'm just like screaming at the people in line. And I'm saying, I have friends who like, became afraid of me after they're like, Oh God, don't wear fur around honey LeBronx. Like she will throw red paint on you. And I'm like, mm -hmm, absolutely will. And if you don't like that, just don't wear fur. But, um, people started commenting in the comments, like, why are they all Asian? Why are there so many Asians? And I'm like, I'm just like shutting that down. Cause I'm like, first of all, that's not what we're here for. We're not here saying like Asian people are bad. Like, that's not, that's not why we're here today. And secondly, I'm like, why are there so many Asian people buying coats at Canada Goose? Probably because I think what 60% of the world's population is Asian. Like they're an enormous continent. There are so many people from Asia, like from greater Asia. Like there's just a lot of them. That's why you're seeing so many. Like, like uh, I know that when I first moved to New York, I'm from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, which is the number one most racially segregated city in the United States. There are over 19,600 cities in this country. I am from the most racially segregated city. Moving to New York and getting on the train, I remember looking around one day and I'm like, I am one of two white people on this crowded train. And I was delighted for once in my life to not just automatically be the majority. And I think we're just so used to we're the majority that it's jarring to a white person when you suddenly find yourself in a space. Like my, I live in the second largest residential building in New York City. This building is, I don't know if I would say it's predominantly Asian, but it's very noticeably Asian because we're not used to seeing so many non-white people of one specific origin in one place. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, I felt it was worth doing an episode specifically on that topic just because we've seen a rise in hate crimes. Um, I, can't, I, can't even, I can't even talk about it. It's, it's so troubling to me. But I would love for people to check that out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I did. I did listen to um, uh, a uh, a significant portion of that one. And, um, you know what, I just, I, my, I have to say that my, I, when I read what Brian Adams had written, 
he did not he did not just to clarify he did never say anything chinese he said bat eaters he said bat eaters which implies i understand it can imply I in, our brain, in, in our china brain. in there there no there's not there's okay. not um and so to me i sort of i sort of thought well you know what where, where i would like us to get as a species is where we're just like we're humans right and the problem is is speciesism is that all humans all not all humans but humans of of every continent of every color and culture all there's always an element of thinking that animals are something that we can use and abuse. And so really, as a collective human group, mm -hmm. we are all speciesist. Yeah, yeah. By the way, just in, uh, I just looked up the um, tweet. You're right, it does not mention China. We all know who he's talking about. We all know he is not invoking the idea of white people when he's referring to a people as bat eaters. I, I like, I don't accept if he's making the claim that it's not, that it's not racist. First off, how do you know you're talking to a racist? They say they're not racist. That's how you know. I will tell you, here we are, we are being recorded. This is for a podcast. I am, we're going to show this to the world. I will gladly say, I am Honey LeBronx, the vegan drag queen. I am a racist. Boom. I will say that. I am sexist, I am racist, I am speciesist, I am transphobic, I am homophobic, I am all of these things. The day I forget that I am, like all of us were brought up in a racist world. There's just no one alive. Maybe the people that were on that island that the Christian missionary went to and whatever, maybe there's rare exceptions, but even the exceptions prove the rule. Every one of us was born and raised and socialized in a racist, sexist, transphobic world. It is impossible to escape being racist, sexist, and transphobic. But I remember one day, I remember thinking, this is such an aside, I apologize, but I remember one day I remembered thinking to myself, well, I can't be sexist, I'm gay. And <laughs> <laughs> I find that so funny now, but at the time I was like, I can't be sexist. And I, I thank God, I don't know if it's God or if it's my mind, I just thank God this thought went through my head. As soon as I thought that, the next thought in my head was, what if I'm sexist and I don't know it? And that day, I went through my entire day, like, okay, if I'm sexist and I don't know it, then there's going to be a lot of things I don't notice. There's going to be a lot of the, a lot of things that I are normalized for me. There's going to be a lot of things I say and do and partake in, and I just went through my day hyper aware of sexism. And um, I'm a person in recovery, so I was at a 12 step meeting that is mostly men, and it's one where people all talk out of turn. You don't wait your turn. You don't raise your hand. You don't only get one chance to share. It's like being on the View. Um, and the men never really interrupt each other. It's sort of a cross talk back and forth conversation, which is not normal in 12 step. But at this day, there was one woman there. And finally, when she chose to say something, she's, you know, said, yeah, well, you know, I think that it's the blah, blah, blah. Immediately a guy interrupts her. He's like, oh, you know why that is? That's because blah, 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 blah. She waits, she lets him finish. And she's like, yeah, well, when I say that, what I really mean to say is that blah, blah, blah. Oh, well, you know why that is? No, that's another guy interrupted her. She never opened her mouth again at that meeting. And I remember like seeing it and I was just like, like I was seeing that for the first time at probably what, 32? And I remember I went home and I was talking to my mom and my sister and I told them what I saw and they're like, sounds like a Monday. and. <laughs> I was talking about my feelings about this and I was so upset. And then in the conversation, they're like, yeah, uh, um, you're kind of doing it to us in this conversation. I was like, oh my God, I can't get away from it. So the day I stop owning that I am those things is the day that I'm going to take part in them without, without taking responsibility for it. It's true. Um, but yeah, you, yeah. You said the Brian Adam things, and then there was another thing that you said right before that, 
uh, ugh, I'm not going to try to get my, I, I, I'm done trying to get my trains of thought back. If it That's comes back to me, it comes back to me. A long time ago. Yeah. He did apologize as well. And I didn't, I, I did I, it, I read it, but it was a long time ago. So yeah. maybe his apology said, oh my gosh, I'm racist. And I just did that racist thing. Yeah. I'm really yeah. sorry. Right. Cause what else yeah. can we do? I know it's like, it's like we we were born into this culture and it's like it's like being in a swimming pool and thinking that you cannot get wet right i mean <laughs> we, we have all these that is so perfect uh, tendencies yeah. and um yeah the mansplaining thing is always enjoyable yeah mansplain so mansplaining is this thing where men will condescend to women and will explain I'm, oh really is I'm, that no because i thought if I could just interrupt for a moment, no, you know what? There was one video that I really liked on your, um, on, well, I liked lots of them on your, uh, vegan, uh, cooking show. What's it called? Vegan drag queen. Vegan drag queen. Yeah. I love it. Thank you. I love it. And I sent it to one of my, um, bestest gay friends. We've been friends for like 30 years and he's pre vegan still. And, but I know he loves drag queens, so I'm hoping, you know, um, we plant our seeds, right? But there was a, yes. I think it was on there where you went dumpster diving. Was yes, in Toronto. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That's so, and there, the whole dumpster was just full of incredible food. What a I was staying with someone in Toronto and she was talking about dumpster diving. And I remembered thinking like, listen, I'm vegan. I'm not one of those vegans you know like yeah and then she told ah. me she's like you know how we all say that animal agriculture is the number one cause of um you know uh climate change she's like nope it's the second the first is food waste and i'm like get out of here and she said food going into landfill can creates so much methane and so destructive but, and I remember someone was talking to me. I gave someone like a tour of my apartment and they noticed that I wasn't composting. And I'm like, no, but I put all my food scraps in the garbage. All the recycling goes here. Just the food scraps and garbage, garbage goes here. And she's like, right. And then it goes into landfill. I'm like, yes. And she's like, how do you think biodegrading works when oxygen can't get in there? And I was like, oh. And the idea of that much food just going into the ground. Like, where would that ever happen in nature? You know what else? I, I also think, like, everyone's baking bread right now, but I'm like, where in nature would we ever find bread? Like, is there anything more unnatural? How did we invent, anyway. But, um, so she, this was after a show one day, and on this tour, I brought a friend of mine because he wanted to do, like, a documentary of my tour still haven't edited any of that footage but i have hours of it and um on the drive home she's like if you don't mind i just want to stop here real quick and i'm like the store's closed and she's like uh-huh we're going around back and she's like you don't have to come out with me and i'm like i'm in full drag i have a video crew with me i'm like oh we're going dumpster diving and you know when i hear dumpster diving yes it sounds disgusting to me until you see it an entire dumpster fills with peppers red orange yellow peppers sure i probably wouldn't want the ones on top that were touching the lid or the ones on the side or the ones on the bottom but you sweep aside a few layers and in the middle there's peppers that are only touching other peppers i did not realize how not unclean dumpster diving is and the idea that there's that much food why would i waste money on it and why would i allow that food to go into the dump oh my god it changed my life that day see and you can't really do that to my knowledge in new york because we don't have dumpsters really if you've been to manhattan there's no room for anything space is at such a premium when restaurants and grocery stores get rid of their garbage at night, they take it out the front door and they set it on the curb. So like garbage bags, sometimes like three or four feet high or like a, a certain number of meters high, just line the sidewalk. We don't even think about it because it's so normal to us because then overnight, 
the um, trash vehicles come by and they throw those in the vehicle and they collect them. But people, when they're like, you guys just put trash out on the street? And I'm like, yeah, like where else would you put? So there, you couldn't, I don't think you could really dumpster dive in mm. New York City because it doesn't go in a dumpster. It goes in a bag out in the street. Wow. All right. Well, there's so much going on and so much to get involved with. And um, you've had a long day and I've had a long day and I'd love to keep chatting with you and maybe we could do it another time. Um, sure, sure. But right now I think we could wrap it um, here and send people over to your Big Fat Vegan Radio podcast, which is fabulous. And Thank you. your YouTube, which is Vegan Drag Queen. Vegan Drag Queen, yeah. So people can check out um, my cooking show on you. Actually, if you go to vegandragqueen.com, uh, you should be able to, you know what? Let me look this up on my phone because I forget whether I put this on there. I think I meant to make a page on my site where every possible way of connecting with me is listed right there. You um, know what I, I can actually tell you because I have a little list of things that um, oh. tweaks to your website, as a matter of fact, because yeah. I, I was looking for your podcast and there is a link at the bottom of your page under the main section and all the different, and I click on that and it doesn't go anywhere. But right, I, 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 I have to, to fix that. Thank yeah, you. I, I think I got there from your Facebook. Yeah, thank you. Well, basically the podcast is a Big Fat Vegan Radio, just anywhere podcasts are found. We're not on Spotify yet, but um, but if you do go to vegandragqueen.com and just click on about, it will list all the different um, ways that you can connect with me. Um, if you scroll to the bottom of the page there, it'll give you a link to my Patreon. So if you find what I am doing valuable, um, you can always support my work for just a couple of months, a couple of dollars a month, which I know doesn't sound like it's a big deal, but like every month when that chunk of change comes in, it's not a lot, but it's always like, Oh, here's my phone bill for the month. Um, there's a link to my Facebook page that you can like, you can send me a friend request. I'm making extra Facebook accounts now, so I can accept everyone's friend requests. Um, you can find me on Twitter, Instagram, uh, at Honey LeBronx. Um, and you can also subscribe to me on YouTube. I'm also on Twitch and Periscope, all as uh, Honey LeBronx. And, and you do, you maintain all of that. Honey does all that work. And Ben, I guess. It's all just me. Wow. It's a lot. It's a lot of work. And listen, I have a, a raging case of ADHD. Like my ADHD is, uh, if any, by, by the way, if anyone out there is dealing with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder and you have problems with executive function or starting a task or switching tasks once you're you're working on this but now because it's this time you have to switch to this but you can't there is a youtube channel i found called how to adhd and it is one of the most helpful resources i've ever found in dealing with my adhd the second most helpful resource other than just various podcasts Someone on Facebook recommended it to me yesterday or two days ago. There's a website called focusmate.com. Is it mate or mates? I'm going to double check. 80% um, of people with ADHD need the physical presence of another person in the room or they can't concentrate. So whenever someone comes over, as soon as you walk in my apartment, I immediately start picking up garbage. I immediately start putting things away. Not because I feel I should, because I have the energy to. And you can imagine what has been very difficult for me during this time is not having company. Focusmate, it's free. You get three free sessions a week, 50 minute sessions. Or if you want to pay five bucks a month, you get unlimited. Um, it's almost like chat roulette. I signed up, I scheduled the session. It automatically paired me with some random man somewhere else in the world. And I, I put my uh, screen, uh, screen shared my phone to my TV and I put my phone on a little tripod. So we both told each other what we were working on. I'm like, I need to tidy the living room. Um, and then he's like, okay, I need to finish one section of this paper I have to write. And we're like, all right, uh, do you mind if I mute? He's like, yeah, I'm gonna mute the, mute the mic and then I'll check in with you in 45 minutes. 
the whole time I'm working on my living room, there's just some guy typing a paper on my TV. And then after 50 minutes, we checked in like, hey, did you get it done? He's like, yeah, I finished all of that. So it's just like ra- the, the presence of a random person by video chat and you're only there to focus on getting something done. So if anyone has ADHD, I hope that resource is helpful for you because it's a lifesaver to me. That's hilarious. I've never heard that. Yeah. Well, and your place looks great. Look, it's all cleaned up and everything. Oh my God. It's <laughs> such a mess. It's just so busy, you know? And if it does get messed up, you can just put another photo on the green screen, I guess. What I was it. trying to, this is what I used for the past convert. If I turned the background off, which I seem to not be able to, it's just a green screen. It's a giant, professional, well-lit green screen. Um, but uh, I was trying to change it for this conversation. I was like Googling like dirty public bathroom or like gas station <laughs> bathroom. Uh, I was trying to find that. And then what was the other one I was trying to find? It was just like, like I don't know, like a stage at a drag show or something. So I was trying to find something, something funny, but it wouldn't let me switch. No, Thank God. this is meant to be. It's meant to be, yes. Yeah. So um, just, I want to just really thank you for taking the time today and My um, pleasure. sharing all of this and for all the work that you're doing. Are, are you planning any online fundraisers? You know, I haven't yet. Um, I suppose I should. You know, um, my drag grandmother, there's sort of like a drag lineage, if you will. So like drag queens will have a drag daughter at someone they mentor and then a drag mom. So my drag mom is Bob the Drag Queen. She won season eight of RuPaul's Drag Race. And when I was in Berkeley visiting her, she was doing a play out there. Um, she introduced me to her drag mom. She never had a drag mom. She just got one. Her drag mom is Peaches Christ, who is this huge drag legend. And Peaches said, you know who your drag great grandmother is? And I'm like, who? Elvira. Elvira is my drag great grandmother. So, but, um, Peaches puts on all these shows like drag becomes her, um, or legally black. She had Bob in that one. Um, uh, all these different, like she'll take famous movies and stuff and she'll do drag parodies of them, puts on these huge productions with big stars in the drag community. And um, I was like, God, I have such ADD. It, it, it must make you so nervous uh, when you announce that you're gonna do this, having to sit down and write the script. And he said to me, if you, he's like, if you wanna force yourself to focus on getting something done, put tickets on sale. The minute you put up the ticket sale link and people start buying it, you're like, oh God, I better finish this. So (laughs) I I come up with a new number to perform maybe every 18 months. Last week, Wednesday, I took part in an online digital drag show and I pitched him, it was Wizard of Oz theme, so I pitched him the idea of doing a Somewhere Over the Rainbow parody song. Um, I, I basically called it Let's Make Over the Rainbow about changing the rainbow flag to include black and brown and to include the trans flag. I finished writing the lyrics the morning of the show, pulled an all-nighter, threw my face on, three hours after I promised him the video. They're, they're like, where is your video? We're going live. And like, I threw this up. I did one take, all the lip sync was off. Um, but like it forced me to write a new number because I had to do it in a few hours. Miyoko of Miyoko's Creamery, she hired me to do the grand opening of her new factory and she wanted me to perform a special number about cheese. I had this no- this idea for a parody song about dairy that had been in my head for years. I finished writing the lyrics in the hour before I was supposed to leave for the airport and then raced to record it in one take and just made my flight. So giving yourself a deadline kind of forces me to do something. So I should just say at some point in mid to late June, I will do my first um, online fundraiser show. So if you're seeing this, contact me and uh, tell me that you want me to raise money for you and I'll do it in June. Bam. Right on. Okay, so you've got you set the date for the show, and then you get the fund the the groups who need the fundraising. So those could be animal sanctuaries or yeah, animal sanctuaries or activist groups. Um, 
I mean, I, I really don't care who or what. If you are willing to partner with me and stay in communication with me, that is the, the most important thing to me in the world. And I'm bad at staying in communication, but if you're saying yes to working on a fundraiser show with me, I need you to be thorough to follow instructions and to stay in communication up until the day of the show because I've done 111 of these. It's, 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 not, it's not a mystery to me how to have a successful show. And when I tell people, if we wanna make a lot of money, we have to do this and this and this and this by this date, this date, this date, this date. And when people just kind of sit back and don't do that, and then the day of the show, they're always like, well, you know, we tried. And I'm like, first of all, you didn't. You just did not try. Uh, secondly, like, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not okay. Any, oh, anyway. And thirdly, I just finished writing this song 10 minutes ago. So you've got 10 minutes to get your shoot together. You know, I had an English teacher in middle school who used to say, at the end of class, he's like, you know, take the last five minutes to get a head start on your homework. And people will be like, five minutes? That's that. He's like, if you don't think you can do a lot in five minutes, try holding your breath. Ah, yeah. <laughs> you can do yeah. a lot in five minutes. That's right. So, and, it, and definitely setting that date. Okay, so now I've signed up for your newsletter. And Great. so I, I will hear about this show then. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Because I have to say, you know, COVID is a, a world altering thing for every, everybody on the planet. I mean, it's an amazing thing, really, when you think of it in terms of, every individual on this planet life Absolutely. will never be the same right and yeah. but so many amazing things are coming out of it you know like i got to meet you for example from the animal I mean, and, and, and think about how many people who live with uh physical handicaps and disabilities or they're bedridden or housebound and for years, like, no, I'm sorry, our college doesn't do online classes. And now everyone does online. Every So angry. I'm, like, I'm glad it's done now, but it's like you couldn't do it when people needed it as an accommodation. But now, so I do love that it, like, it's like September 11th, I feel like it turned us from a localized world where we only saw the borders of our country or our state and now we're all in a global world. Like we're all very aware of other countries. And I feel like COVID has turned us into like a virtually connected world where we're learning how to, you know, I, I, I'm a big fan. I think, it's, I think it's wonderful technology. Oh, thank goodness we have the technology, yes. Oh God, yeah. <laughs> Let's hope that there's not something else going around that causes the Wi-Fi to go down. Oh, don't even say that. Eesh. Don't even say that. Yeah. How they ever survived the 1918 oh. flu. That is, yeah. No. So, okay. Thank you so much, honey. Yeah, likewise. Really wonderful to meet you. And I, I'll hope to see you again sometime. Thank you. You too. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Yeah.